Figure 1 shows the apparatus used for measuring the rate of oxygen consumption in aerobic respiration by seeds. For the first 10 minutes, the tap attached to tube A was left open and the syringe from tube B was removed. Suggest three reasons why the apparatus was left for 10 minutes. Well, one of the reasons is to allow for an equilibrium to be reached throughout the apparatus, as when the reaction or the practical begins, we don't want any other factor playing a part in our result. Another reason is to allow for pressure change within the apparatus. For our third and final reason, we can relate our answer to how the respiration rate of seeds change over time. Now, we know that with any sort of organism, over a period of time, the respiration rate will not only change, but will adapt to its conditions. Now that we've left the apparatus for 10 minutes, within that time period, the respiration rate of the seeds would have increased because we've introduced oxygen to them. So as a result, we can say that within that 10 minutes, we're allowing the respiration rate of the seeds to stabilize before we start to take our measurements. Suggest and explain why the chosen temperature was 20 degrees for this experiment. Now the reason for choosing 20 degrees as the temperature is to not only reenact the temperature for which the normal growth of seeds would occur at, but it's also to provide an optimal temperature for which respiratory enzymes can work at. After 10 minutes, the tap attached to tube A was closed and the syringe was attached to tube B. Every minute, the syringe plunger was moved until the levels of the U-tube were the same. The reading on the syringe volume scale was then recorded. The results are shown in Table 1. During the experiment, the coloured liquid in the tubing moved towards tube B. Explain what caused this. Now looking closely, we know that the seeds inside of tube B are respiring, so they're taking up oxygen and producing carbon dioxide and water. But interestingly, there's a presence of potassium hydroxide here at the bottom of test tube B. So as this is absorbing carbon dioxide, we're in fact removing the product of carbon dioxide. We're removing oxygen that's remaining inside of the apparatus. And because we only have a limited supply of oxygen, we're removing or decreasing the volume within tube B. Now, the only presence of oxygen remaining, if we disregard tube B, e, is inside of this U-tube here, which contains the colored liquid, but also inside of the one centimeter cube syringe. But after a while, as you're consistently taking measurements, you're going to use up the limited supply of oxygen. So after a period of time where the oxygen has been used up, the oxygen that's remaining inside of the tube here will be taken in by the seeds. But as a result, you're replicating a vacuum mechanism where the colored liquid inside of the U-tube will be pulled up as follows. As the volume inside of tube B decreases, the colored liquid inside of the U-tube draws up towards the right-hand side. So to answer the question, we can say that as the seeds respire throughout the experiment, oxygen is taken up. At the same time, carbon dioxide is given out. But this is absorbed by the potassium hydroxide solution at the bottom of tube B. As a result, the volume inside of tube B decreases, causing the coloured liquid in the tubing to move towards tube B. So the first mark here is for saying that the oxygen is taken up by the seeds during the respiration. The second mark is for saying that CO2 is absorbed by the potassium hydroxide solution. And then the final mark is offered for saying that the volume in tube B decreases. The mass of the seeds was 1.6 grams. Use the information in table one to calculate the rate of oxygen consumption in centimeters cubes, gram to the minus one, hour to the minus one by the seeds. Show your working. So if we were to retrace our steps, if we were doing this experiment and coming up with some sort of rate, we would need our answer, or we need our values to be in the form of each of these units. And then we would divide each of the values together to form the equation. And we would need our values to be in the exact form as such, where we have our, a value of centimeters cubed, and we divide it by the mass of the seed, and then we divide it by the hour in which the change has taken place over. So if we go to table one, we can accumulate these values and therefore put it into some sort of calculation to get our answer. So if we find the difference between the value at zero minutes and the value at 10 minutes, we have our first value in centimeters cubed. 
So we can do 0 0.84 subtracted by 0 0.58 to give us 0 0.26 centimeters cubed. So we have our centimeter cubed value. Now we already know in the question that the masses remain constant at 1.6 grams. But what will catch many students out is forgetting to convert the minutes, which the original table is given to us in, into hours, because our final answer is in respect to centimeters cubed, gram to the minus one, hours to the minus one. So we know that 60 minutes equals one hour. So if we were to now divide each side by six, we would find how many hours 10 minutes is. So we can say that 10 minutes equals a sixth of an hour. So we now have all the information we need. If we go back to the question, we can now do our working out. So now that we have our values, we need to input them into a calculation to get the answer with respect to the units that are given. So we know that our rate needs to be equal to the centimeters cubed value divided by grams divided by hours. Now we calculated that within the 10 minutes, which is the a sixth of the hour, we calculated that the change in centimeters cubed was 0 0.26. And we were also told in the question that the mass of the seeds remained 1.6 grams. So if we now carry out this calculation, we find that the answer comes to 0 0.975. So the rate is equal to 0 0.98. Describe the roles of calcium ions and ATP in the contraction of a myofibril. So we can originally start by saying that the calcium ions diffuse into the myofibrils from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so we can say that the calcium ions cause the movement of tropomyosin molecules blocking the binding sites. And this movement causes the binding sites of the actin to be exposed. The myosin heads attached to the binding sites of the actin this changes their angle, pulling the actin filament along as they do so. As a result, this releases a molecule of ADP. So the next stage of the process is to talk about how an ATP molecule attaches to each myosin head. And this causes the myosin head to become detached from the actin filament. Now the presence of the calcium ions in the first place actually activate the enzyme ATPase and this hydrolyzes the ATP molecule attached to each myosin head and hydrolyzes it to ADP. Now the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP actually provides energy for the myosin head to return into its original position. And now the final point we can mention is that the myosin heads that had only the presence of ADP now after the hydrolysis of ATP, they reattach themselves further along the actin filament and as a result the cycle repeats itself. So the first mark on the mark scheme is for saying that the calcium ions diffuse into the myofibrils from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The second mark is saying that the calcium ions cause movement of the tropomyosin on the actin. The next mark is for saying that the movement of the calcium ions cause exposure of the binding sites of the actin. Now saying that the myosin heads attached to the binding sites of the actin gives you the fourth possible mark. Now following on from this point, mentioning that the myosin heads pull on the actin filament gains you the next mark. Now the sixth possible marking point is for saying that the presence of the calcium ions have caused the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and this has provided energy for the myosin heads to bend and return to their initial position. Now the seventh possible mark is for saying that the attachment of a new ATP molecule to each myosin head causes the myosin heads to detach from the actin sites. Now, although we've mentioned that the myosin head attaches further down the actin filament, we could make this more clearer by saying that the attachment of a new ATP molecule to each myosin head causes myosin heads to detach from the actin sites. ATP is an energy source used by many cell processes. Give two ways in which ATP is a suitable energy source for cells to use. Now ATP is called the universal energy carrier and this is because it's used in pretty much all reactions in all organisms. 
And so as a result, ATP must be very efficient and very easy to synthesize in order to allow for organisms to benefit from using ATP. Now, one of the many reasons why ATP is a suitable energy source is because it releases energy instantaneously. So another reason why ATP is a suitable energy source is because it releases relatively small amounts of energy each particular time it's required and little energy is actually lost as heat. So we can say for our second point that ATP releases relatively small amounts of energy when hydrolyzed and as a result little energy is lost as heat. In fruit flies, the genes for body colour and wing length are linked. Explain what this means. Well, if two genes are linked, it means that they both lie on the same chromosome. So we can say that the genes for body colour and wing length are on the same chromosome. A scientist investigated linkage between genes for body colour and wing length. He carried out crosses between fruit flies with grey bodies and long wings and fruit flies with black bodies and short wings. Figure 2 shows his crosses and the results. Capital G represents the dominant allele for grey body and lowercase g represents the recessive allele for black body. Capital N represents the dominant allele for long wings and lowercase n represents the recessive allele for short wings. So the scientist has crossed a fruit fly which has a grey body and long wings with another fruit fly that has a black body and short wings. And the phenotype for all of the offspring is all grey body, long wings. Now he's taken these offspring and he's crossed them with the fruit flies that are homozygous for black body and short wings. And the results are shown below. Use your knowledge of gene linkage to explain these results. So looking at figure three now, we can identify that all of F1 generation offspring will have the genotype of capital G lowercase g, capital N lowercase n. So with that information, let's try and work out what the possible gametes will be for this individual. So now this individual will produce two main gametes that are capital G capital N and lowercase g lowercase n. Now, with any type of inheritance problem which involves linkage, there is a strong possibility that crossing over will occur. There will be two other gametes that will form, but of less quantity compared to number one gamete and number two gamete. And these will be capital G lowercase n and lowercase g capital N. So now that we've understood what the four possible gametes will be, we know that gamete number three and four will be of much less quantity compared to one and two. Now, if we were to cross gamete number three and four with the genotype of the flies that have lowercase g, lowercase g, lowercase n, lowercase n, we'll find that the number of offspring produced with that genotype will be much less because originally we've got less gametes of number three and four. So if we were to cross as such, we would form the genotype of capital G, lowercase g, lowercase n, lowercase n, and lowercase g, lowercase g, capital N, lowercase n. Now, I've aligned the genotype with the correct phenotype for the offspring, and we can see that the number of offspring that will be produced from these gametes here will be much lower, and we see that is the case when we identify from the table which number of offsprings are at their lowest form. So we know that capital G, lowercase g, capital N, lowercase n individuals produce mainly the capital G, capital N, and lowercase g, lowercase n gametes. In addition, crossing over has produced fewer gametes of the form capital G, lowercase n, and lowercase g, capital N. When we cross the gametes that were produced by crossing over, with the organisms that contain the genotype lowercase g, lowercase g, lowercase n, lowercase n, we find that fewer individuals with the genotype capital G, lowercase g, lowercase n, lowercase n, and lowercase g, lowercase g, capital N, lowercase n are produced. Therefore, this data proves that capital G, capital N, and lowercase g, lowercase n are linked. So the mark scheme offers four points, four marks. 
So interestingly, the first mark that has been awarded in the mark scheme is for saying that capital G, capital N and lowercase g, lowercase n are linked. And this is how we have concluded at the end of our answer, but the mark scheme has offered this as the first marking point. So the second mark is offered for mentioning that the individuals of genotypes as such produce mainly the gametes of capital G, capital N and lowercase g, lowercase n. So the next mark is offered for referencing crossing over and how this process produces fewer gametes in the form of capital G, lowercase n and lowercase g, capital N. And then the final mark is for saying that as a result, fewer individuals of the genotype as follows is produced. So if these genes were not linked, what ratio of phenotypes would the scientists have expected to obtain in the offspring? So if there was no linkage between the genes, then we would expect a ratio of 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, as there would be no crossing over, so we wouldn't have alternative gametes produced. So as a result, we would expect this following ratio. Which statistical test could the scientist use to determine whether his observed results were significantly different from the expected results? Give the reason for your choice of statistical test. So the statistical test we would use would be a chi-square test. And the reason for this is because the data in the table is nominal data. And what I mean by this is that it's in the form of frequencies and in a number of categories. So we can write for our reasoning that this is because the data is categorical. A biologist investigated the stimulation of a Pacinian corpuscle in the skin of a fingertip. She used microelectrodes to measure the maximum membrane potential of a Pacinian corpuscle and its sensory neuron when different pressures were applied to the fingertip. Figure 4 shows the Pacinian corpuscle, its sensory neuron and the position of the microelectrodes. Table 2 shows some of the biologist's results. Explain how the resting potential of minus 70 millivolts is maintained in the sensory neuron when no pressure is applied. So we can say that the axon membrane is more permeable to potassium ions and less permeable to sodium ions. To maintain the concentration and uneven distribution of ions across the membrane, the Na plus ions are actively transported out of the cell whilst the K plus ions move in. So the first mark is for mentioning that the axon membrane is more permeable to the potassium ions rather than to the sodium ions. And then the second mark is for talking about the Na plus ions are actively transported out whilst the K plus ions move in. Explain how applying pressure to the Pacinian corpuscle produces the changes in membrane potential recorded by microelectrode P. Well, the application of pressure causes the axon membrane to become stretched. This stimulus causes some of the voltage-gated sodium channels in the axon membrane to open. The increase in permeability allows for Na plus ions to rapidly diffuse into the axon down their concentration gradient. With an increase in pressure exerted, the permeability of the axon membrane increases, allowing for more sodium ions to enter. Now the first mark here is for talking about how the application of pressure causes the membrane to stretch, or you could have even said that the lamella becomes deformed. The second mark is for talking about how the sodium ion channels in the membrane open and that the sodium ions move in to the axon. And then the final mark is for mentioning that with a greater pressure exerted onto the Pacinian corpuscle, more channels are opened and therefore more sodium ions enter. The membrane potential at Q was the same where the medium or heavy pressure was applied to the fingertip. Explain why. The certain threshold value had been reached and caused a maximal response. Multiple sclerosis is a disease in which parts of the myelin sheath surrounding the neurons are destroyed. Explain how this results in slower responses to stimuli. So myelination speeds up the rate of transmission by insulating the axon. So removing the myelin sheets will not only reduce the rate in which the transmission occurs along the axon, but will also cause for no saltatory conduction. So as a result, there will be more depolarization over the length of the membrane.
Silkworms secrete silk fibres, which are harvested and used to manufacture silk fabric. Scientists have produced genetically modified silkworms that contain a gene from a spider. The GM silkworms secrete fibres made from the spider web protein spider silk, which is stronger than normal silk fibre protein. The method the scientists used is shown in Figure 5. Step 1. Isolate the gene from the spider. Step 2. Insert the spider gene into a plasmid with a marker gene called EGFP. This gene codes for a protein that glows brightly in UV light. Step 3. Inject copies of this plasmid into many eggs of the silkworms. Step 4. Allow silkworm eggs that have taken up the plasmid to grow and produce spider silk. So just why the plasmids were injected into the eggs of the silkworms rather than into the silkworms? Well, if the plasmids were injected into the egg, the gene will get into most of the cells of the silkworm. So therefore, it will get into the cells that make the silk. So just why the scientists use their marker gene and why they use the EGFP gene? So we're told that the spider gene has a marker gene attached to it, and this is the EGFP gene. Now, if this gene is successfully taken up by the plasmid, it will glow brightly in UV light. And so, as not all the eggs will have successfully taken up the plasmid, the marker gene indicates which of the silkworms have taken up the genes through glowing in UV light. The scientists ensured the spider gene was expressed only in cells within the silk glands. What would the scientists have inserted into the plasmid along with the spider gene to ensure that the spider gene was only expressed in the silk glands of the silkworm? Well, this would have been a promoter gene. And this is a sequence of DNA that helps to initiate transcription. Suggest so two reasons why it was important that the spider gene was expressed only in the silk glands of the silkworms. Now, making sure specifically that the spider gene is only expressed in the silk glands of the silkworm allows for the protein to eventually be harvested. Now, we don't know necessarily whether the fibres that are produced by the spider gene may cause harm to the other cells. So making sure that the spider gene is only expressed in the silk glands of the silkworm gives us confidence that we're not harming any other cells. So the second reason that we can say is that the fibres that are produced in other cells may actually cause harm. Malaria is a disease that is spread by insects called mosquitoes. In Africa, DDT is a pesticide used to kill mosquitoes to try to control the spread of malaria. Mosquitoes have a gene called KDR. Today, some mosquitoes have an allele of this gene, KDR- that gives them resistance to DDT. The other allele, KDR+, does not give resistance. Scientists investigated the frequency of the KDR- allele in a population of mosquitoes in an African country over a period of 10 years. Figure 6 shows this scientist's results. Now instantly you can see that over the period of 10 years from the graph, the percentage of KDR- alleles in the population has steadily increased. Use the Hardy-Weinberg equation to calculate the frequency of the mosquito's heterozygous for the KDR gene in this population in 2003. So we're firstly asked to find well, what the frequency of mosquitoes are heterozygous for the KDR gene. Now we're not told in the question whether the KDR minus allele is the dominant allele or if the KDR plus allele is the recessive allele. We're not told this information. We can't assume which is dominant and which is recessive. Instead, we can use a key point that we know from the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And that is that if we know that P plus Q equals 1, and we know that there's going to be two alleles, in this case, the KDR minus and KDR plus. Now, if we take one as being dominant and the other as being recessive, regardless of which one we choose, they have to equal 1. And so we can see that in 2003, the percentage of KDR minus alleles is 20%. 
Now, if we assume that KDL minus was the dominant allele, taking 20%, then Q must be 80% in regards to the KDL plus allele. And that is in order to make it equal to one. So now that we have the proportion of alleles, regardless of which one we decide is P and Q, we can input these two values into our Hardy-Weinberg equation of P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals one. So now that we've identified that we need to work out the frequency of the mosquito's heterozygous for the KDR gene, which in other words is the frequency of the heterozygous genotype, we have to input our two values into the 2PQ section of the Hardy-Weinberg equation. So we can say that KDR minus allele equals 0.2. And so as a result, the KDR plus allele must be 0.8. Now to find the frequency of mosquitoes that are heterozygous for the KDR gene, the key word here is heterozygous, we have to input these two values that we found into 2PQ, where P can be equal to 0.2 and Q can be equal to 0.8. Regardless of which one we choose as P and Q, we have to input both these values in, so it doesn't matter. So we can say 2 times by 0 0.2 times by 0 0.8 equals 0 0.32. And so the frequency of the heterozygotes in the population in 2003 was 0 0.32. Suggest an explanation for the results in figure 6. So originally in 1999, we can see that the percentage of KDR minus alleles in the population was zero. But something must have happened between this period of time to cause an increase or beginning of an increase in the percentage of the allele. Now, the increase in this allele percentage is due to a mutation that has produced this KDR minus allele. So we can say that the use of the DET provides a selection pressure. So the mosquitoes that have this KDR minus allele now have a particular characteristic that is advantageous and allows for their likelihood of survival to increase. Now increasing their survival chances means that we're increasing their ability to reproduce in the time that they're alive. And so in fact, this leads to an increase over time in the KDR minus allele percentage in the population. So we can say a mutation has produced the KDR minus resistance allele. The DDT pesticide used to kill the mosquitoes has provided a selection pressure. The KDR minus allele is advantageous in this particular environment. And so the mosquitoes that have the KDR minus allele are more likely to survive and reproduce. Therefore, over time, we see a steady increase in the KDR minus allele percentage in this population. So the first mark here is for saying that the KDR minus allele is formed through a mutation. The second mark is through saying that the DDT pesticide use has produced a selection pressure. So the third mark is for saying that the mosquitoes that have the KDR minus allele have a higher chance of survival and therefore are able to reproduce. And then finally, the fourth mark is for saying that we then see an increase or a steady increase in the KDR minus allele percentage in the population. The KDR plus allele codes for the sodium ion channels found in the neurons. When DDT binds to the sodium ion channel, the channels remain open all the time. Use this information to suggest how DTT kills insects. So if the sodium ion channels remain open all the time, then the neurons will remain depolarized constantly, and so there'll be no impulse transmission. Suggest how the KDR minus allele gives resistance to DDT. So the only way for this to be possible is for a mutation that changes the shape of the sodium ion channel protein. And as a result, the DDT is no longer complementary to the receptor on the protein. Osmoreceptors are specialized cells that respond to changes in the water potential of the blood. Give the location of osmoreceptors in the body of a mammal. Well, this is the hypothalamus. 
When a person is dehydrated, the cell volume of an osmoreceptor decreases. Explain why. So the question has kind of given us a clue towards how we need to answer this question. Now, we're told that because this person is dehydrated, the cell volume of the osmoreceptor decreases. Now, why is this? It's because the water potential of the blood has decreased because there's not enough water present inside of the blood currently. So as a result, with the water potential decreasing, water moves by osmosis from the osmoreceptor into the blood. So we can say for our answer, that as the person is dehydrated, the lack of fluid intake has decreased the water potential of the blood. As a result, by osmosis, water moves from the osmoreceptor into the blood. Stimulation of osmoreceptors can lead to the secretion of the hormone ADH. Describe and explain how the secretion of ADH affects urine produced by the kidneys. So now if we take the route as if the person is dehydrated in this case, we would say that there would be an increased secretion of ADH. Now this is because ADH works in a negative feedback response, meaning that if a person is dehydrated and their water potential of the blood has decreased, ADH will work in the opposite direction, meaning that it will increase its secretion of the hormone so that it increases the permeability of the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct walls. So more water is reabsorbed and therefore less urine will be produced. So to answer this question, we can say that increasing the secretion of ADH increases the permeability of the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct walls to water. As a result, more water is reabsorbed from the medulla into the blood in the vasorector. As the water potential of the blood is restored to normal, a small volume of urine is produced that is more concentrated than usual. Now, the mark scheme offers four different points for four marks. The first can be gained by talking about how the permeability of the membrane, i.e. the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts, increase to water. The second is by mentioning that more water is reabsorbed. The third mark is for then talking about how small volume of urine is actually produced. And the final mark is for mentioning that it's more concentrated than usual. The efficiency with which the kidneys filter the blood can be measured by the rate at which they remove a substance called creatinine from the blood. The rate at which they filter the blood is called the glomerular filtration rate, GFR. In 24 hours, a person excreted 1,660 milligrams of creatinine in his urine. The concentration of creatinine in the blood entering his kidneys was constant at 0.01 milligrams per centimeters cubed. Calculate the GFR in centimeters cubed per minute. So we're being asked to calculate what the GFR is in centimeters cubed per minute. We're told in the question that the person excreted 1,660 milligrams of creatinine in his urine in 24 hours, but the question wants us to give our answer in terms of minutes. So it may be a good place to start in terms of working out what 24 hours is in minutes. And we know that 24 hours is equal to 1,440 minutes. Now with this information as a stepping stone, we need to work out what the creatinine excreted was per minute. So in order to work this out, we do 1,660 divided by 1,440 to give us our answer. Now this comes to 1.1527 recurring milligrams per minute. So now we need to find out what the volume of blood needed to be filtered through the glomerulus over this period of time will be to get the amount of creatinine filtered out. Now, although we're not told specifically in the question what the volume is, we have been given the concentration of 0.01 milligrams per centimetres cubed. So if we look closely at this value on the unit given, we're basically being told that per centimetres cubed that's filtered, we will get 0.01 milligrams of creatinine. And we've worked out that per minute, 1.1527 recurring milligrams of creatinine is removed. 
So if we divide the amount of creatine removed by how much is in each of the centimeters cubed of blood that's filtered, then all we need to do is 1.1527 recurring divided by 0 0.01 to get our answer. And this comes out to be 115.27 centimeters cubed per minute. So we can round our answer up to one decimal place and say that our answer is 115.3. Creatinine is a breakdown product of creatine found in muscle tissues. Apart from age and gender, give two factors that could affect the concentration of creatinine in the blood. Now, there are a few answers we could give for this, and one being the ethnicity of the person. An alternative answer that we could give is the amount of exercise that a person has done. Now, the mark scheme also gives a point for mentioning the body mass or the muscle mass of an individual. Now, a final factor that you could mention is possibly kidney disease. Now, if the kidneys aren't working properly and we know that creatinine is a waste substance, and if the kidneys are unable to filter out the creatinine from the bloodstream, then the levels will be high. And this would indicate that the kidneys aren't working properly. And so kidney disease can be our final factor. Chloroplasts contain chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Scientists found tobacco plants with a mutation that caused them to make more chlorophyll B than normal tobacco plants. They investigated the effect of this mutation on the rate of photosynthesis. The scientists carried out the following investigation. They grew normal and mutant tobacco plants. They grew some of each in low light intensity and grew others in high light intensity. They isolated samples of chloroplasts from mature plants of both types. Finally, they measured oxygen production by the chloroplasts they had isolated from the plants. Figure 7 shows the scientists' results. So from the graph, we can see that the line that represents the mutant plant's growth in high light had actually produced the most amount of oxygen. But by contrast, the normal plants that were grown in low light, in fact, produce the least amount of oxygen. Explain why the scientists measured the rate of production of oxygen in this investigation. So we're aware that in photosynthesis, two main reactions occur, one being the light dependent reaction and one being the light independent reaction. Now, importantly, during the light dependent reaction, the photolysis of water occurs. Now, at this point, oxygen is actually produced as a waste product, which leaves via gas exchange. So if the scientists were to measure the rate of oxygen production, they would find that the faster the oxygen is produced at, means that the faster the light dependent reaction is occurring at. So we can say that oxygen is produced in the light dependent reaction. And so the faster the rate of production of oxygen, the faster the light dependent reaction. In each trial, the scientists collected oxygen for 15 minutes. Calculate the difference in the oxygen produced by the chloroplasts from the mutant plants grown in low and high light intensities at a light intensity of 500 micromoles photons per meter squared seconds to minus one. Show your working. Now, if we study the graph more closely, we're asked to find the difference between the oxygen production between the mutant plants, okay, so that is the mutant plant here and the mutant plant here, that are both grown at high and low light intensities. And we also need to look closely at the two values at 500 micromoles photons per meter squared seconds to the minus one. So if we find the oxygen produced at 500 for the light intensity, then from there we can identify the difference. We find that the mutant plants grown in high light is around 204. Now the oxygen produced for the mutant plants at low light is around 60. So to find the difference in oxygen produced, we simply do 204 subtracted by 60. And this comes to 144 micromole mg to the minus 1 hour to the minus 1. So we're told here that in each trial, the scientists collected oxygen for 15 minutes. But the graph shows us that this is the oxygen produced per the hour. So the answer of 144 micromoles milligrams to the minus one hour to the minus one 
currently tells us the difference in oxygen produced by the chloroplasts from the mutant plants growing at both low and high light intensities, but over a period of an hour. But we're told in the question that the scientists collected oxygen for the 15 minutes only. So we have to get our answer of 144 and divide it by 4, because there are four 15 minute time periods in one hour. So we do 144 divided by 4. So this gives us 36 micromoles O2 mg to the minus 1 hour to the minus 1. And so we can state this as our answer. The scientists suggested that mutant plants producing more chlorophyll B would grow faster than normal plants in all light intensities. Explain how these data support this suggestion. So if we study the mutant plants grown in high light across the entire range of light intensities, the mutant plants have produced the most amount of oxygen and so therefore have had a faster production of ATP and reduced NADP. So they've had a faster light independent reaction and therefore have been able to produce more sugars that can be used in respiration. And we can see for the mutant plants that they have been able to synthesize new organic materials at a faster rate. So if we were to put that information into a four mark answer, we can say that at all light intensities, the chloroplasts from mutant plants have had a higher production of oxygen. They have also had faster production of ATP and reduced NADP. As a result, the light independent reaction in the mutant plants has been faster. And so they produce more sugars that can be used in respiration. Therefore, they have more energy for growth and are able to synthesize new organic materials faster. So the first mark is for talking about uh, ATP and a reduced NADP production is faster. The next mark is for then saying that the light independent reaction is faster and therefore more sugars can be respired gets you the next mark. Then the following mark is for saying that the mutant plants therefore have more energy for growth. And then the fifth possible marking point is for saying that they're able to synthesize new organic materials faster. Explain how methylation of tumor suppressor genes can lead to cancer. So a tumor suppressor gene slows down cell division, repairs mistakes in DNA, but more importantly, tells the cells when to undergo apoptosis, where apoptosis is programmed cell death. Now, talking about methylation in particular, this is a process that prevents transcription of a gene. So we know that usually the rate at which cell division occurs is controlled by a tumor suppressor gene. Now, turning off or switching off the tumor suppressor gene causes for cell division to become uncontrolled. And this is because we haven't been able to transcribe the tumor suppressor gene to form a protein that prevents cell division from occurring. And this is because we're not transcribing the tumor suppressor gene now to form a protein that allows for apoptosis to occur. So there's no control over mitosis. So we can put this information into a three mark answer and say that the process of methylation prevents the transcription of a gene. As a result, the protein that is usually produced to prevent cell division is no longer transcribed and translated. And so the tumor suppressor gene has been inactivated. Now there is no control over mitosis. And so uncontrolled cell division occurs. Now there's three marking points on offer here for three marks. The first being that transcription of a gene is prevented through methylation. And now the second mark is in regards to saying that the protein that prevents cell division or apoptosis is no longer produced. And then the final mark is for saying that there's no control over mitosis. Scientists investigated a possible relationship between the percentage of fat in the diet and the rate from breast cancer in women from 10 countries. Their data is shown in table three. Describe how you would plot a suitable graph of these data. Explain your choice of type of graph. So our choice of graph type is a scatter graph. And how we would plot this data is through placing the fat on the x-axis and the death rate on the y-axis. Now we should finish with a third point and talk about the relationship between both of the different variables. 
It makes most sense that the percentage of fat in the diet would have an effect on the death rate from breast cancer, rather than in reverse, where the death rate of breast cancer causes a change in the percentage of fat in the diet. So by using common sense, we could say that the relationship between the two variables is that the percentage of fat in the diet has likely affected and impacted the death rate from breast cancer in women. Therefore, we have placed the percentage of fat in diet on the x-axis and the death rate on the y-axis. Now the first mark is for correctly stating that the choice of graph type is a scatter graph, then saying that the percentage of fat in the diet goes on the x-axis and the death rate goes on the y-axis gains you the second mark. And then the third mark is gained through talking about the relationship between both of these variables. And what we've said is that the percentage of fat in the diet has affected and impacted the death rate rather than the death rate impacting the percentage of fat in a diet. And so talking about this relationship has gained us the third mark. So what can you conclude from this data? So let's look at the data points in a bit more detail and draw out some sort of sketch to see if there's a correlation because we have to somewhat come up with a conclusion and we can't come up with a conclusion through not really plotting the graph in some sort of detail. So we've put fat on the x-axis and death on the y-axis. And we can see that over time, although we've suggested that the, there's not really much correlation between, we can actually see once we've plotted the graph that the points do align to some extent, but there are maybe one or two anomalies within the gradual positive correlation curve that we've, we've plotted. So we can say for our answer that there is a positive correlation trend between fat in diet and the death rate of, from breast cancer. And so this data shows that more fat in diet leads to a higher death rate from breast cancer. Although there are a number of anomalies, the positive relationship is still clear. Read the following passage carefully. A large and growing number of disorders are now known to be due to types of mitochondrial disease, MD. MD often affects skeletal muscles, causing muscle weakness. We get our mitochondria from our mothers via the fertilised egg cell. Fathers do not pass on mitochondria via their sperm. Some mitochondrial diseases are caused by mutations of mitochondrial genes inside the mitochondria. Most mitochondrial diseases are caused by mutations of genes in the cell nucleus that are involved in the function of a mitochondria. These mutations of nuclear DNA produce recessive alleles. One form of mitochondrial disease is caused by a mutation of a mitochondrial gene that codes for a tRNA. The mutation involves substitution of guanine for adenine in the DNA base sequence. This changes the anticodon on the tRNA. This results in the formation of a non-functional protein in the mitochondrion. There are a number of ways to try to diagnose whether someone has mitochondrial disease. One test involves measuring the concentration of lactate in the person's blood after exercise. In someone with MD, the concentration is usually much higher than normal. If the lactate test suggests MD, a small amount of DNA can be extracted from mitochondria and DNA sequencing can be used to try to find a mutation. Use information in the passage and your own knowledge to answer the following questions. Mitochondrial disease MD often causes muscle weakness, lines 1 to 3. Use your knowledge of respiration and muscle contraction to suggest explanations for this effect of MD. Now we're told to use knowledge that is tailored towards respiration and muscle contraction. So the first thing we can say is that a reduction in the production of ATP by aerobic respiration causes an individual to be unable to respire for a long period of time. Resorting to anaerobic respiration may result in a buildup of lactic acid, causing fatigue and damage to the muscle cells. This eventually leads to muscle weakness. Within the muscle cells, 
There are fewer interactions between the actin molecules and myosin heads, so less force is generated. Now the first mark is for saying that there's a reduction in the production of ATP via aerobic respiration. The second mark is for saying that less force is generated in the muscle due to the fact that there's fewer actin and myosin interactions. And then the third mark is for saying that there is an overall fatigue, and this is because of the buildup of lactate through the individual resorting to anaerobic respiration. Two couples, couple A and couple B, had one or more children affected by mitochondrial disease. The type of mitochondrial disease was different for each couple. None of the parents showed signs or symptoms of MD. Couple A had four children who were all affected by an MD. Couple B had four children as well, and only one was affected by an MD. Use the information in lines five to nine and your knowledge of inheritance to explain why. All of the couple A's children had MD and only one of couple B's children had an MD. Now between lines five to nine, there are a few key points which are worth mentioning before we return to try and figure out an answer. The first being that some mitochondrial diseases are caused by mutations of the mitochondrial genes inside of the mitochondria. The second is actually prior to this, and that is mentioning that the mitochondria only comes from the mother via the fertilized egg, and that the fathers do not pass on mitochondria. The next is by saying that most mitochondrial diseases are caused by mutations of the genes in the cell nucleus that are involved in the function of the mitochondria. And then the final is saying that these mutations of nuclear DNA produce recessive alleles. Recessive alleles is quite an important point as well. Now, for all of couple A's children to have an MD, there can't have necessarily been a mutation within each and every single one of the individual's offspring, but there must have been a mutation that took place during the formation of the mother's ovary. We can say that a probable mutation in the mitochondrial DNA during the formation of the mother's ovary led to all the children receiving affected mitochondria from the mother. So for couple B, we're told that only one of the couple's children had an MD. Now, we're aware that for couple A, there had to be a mutation in the gamete of the mother for there to possibly be MD in all of the children. So for couple B, if only one child had the condition, then a mutation must have occurred in the DNA of the nucleus affected. But more importantly now, the parents must have been heterozygous because if we know that the mutation produces recessive alleles, now if the MD condition was of a recessive genotype, then the parents must have been heterozygous in order to expect for one in four of them to be homozygous recessive. So we can say that the parents must have therefore been heterozygous in order to produce an offspring with a homozygous recessive genotype. Therefore, we expect one in four of the homozygous offspring to be affected. Now, there's actually six marking points here for this four mark answer. Now, three being awarded for each of couple A and couple B. Now, for couple A, mentioning that a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA gets you the first mark. Now, saying that all the children got affected mitochondria from the mother gains you the next mark. Now, the third mark on offer regarding couple A is mentioning that there was a, probably a mutation during the formation of the mother's ovary. And we have mentioned this through saying that the mitochondrial DNA was actually the mutation during the formation of the mother's ovary. Now for couple B, now mentioning that the mutation has occurred inside of the DNA of the nucleus gains you the fourth possible mark. The fifth is for concluding that the parents must be heterozygous and that is in order to actually form the one in four chance of a homozygous recessive genotype. Suggest how the change in the anticodon of a tRNA leads to MD. Lines 10 to 13. Lines 10 to 13 involve this paragraph here, and the key information includes one form of the mitochondrial disease is caused by a mutation of the mitochondrial gene that codes for the tRNA molecule, and this is what the question is referring to. 
Now, another key point is that the mutation involves the substitution of the guanine for adenine in the DNA base sequence. And this changes the anticodon of the tRNA, and this results in the formation of a non-functional protein in the mitochondrion. So this information here is kind of shaping our answer now. So the question has asked us to suggest how the change in the anticodon of the tRNA leads to MD. Well, changing the anticodon of the tRNA molecule leads to the wrong amino acid being incorporated into your protein polypeptide chain that you're forming. And so if we've changed the tertiary structure, we've essentially formed an alternative protein. But the protein we need is required for the Krebs cycle. But we don't have this protein, so the process isn't going to be as efficient as it should be. So we're going to produce less ATP. So we can put this into a three mark answer and say that a change to the tRNA molecule leads to the wrong amino acid being incorporated into the protein. As a result, the tertiary structure of the protein will change. And the protein required for the Krebs cycle is no longer produced. So respiration is no longer efficient and so less ATP is made. So the first mark is awarded for mentioning that the change in tRNA molecule causes for the wrong amino acid to be incorporated into the protein. Your second mark is for saying that the tertiary structure changes. So the third mark is for then saying that less or no ATP is produced. If someone has MD, the concentration of lactate in their blood after exercise is usually much higher than normal, lines 15 to 17. Suggest why. So we're aware that for someone who has MD, they don't undergo aerobic respiration as often and for as long as somebody who doesn't have this condition. Now, as a result, they're going to produce less ATP. So in order to meet this demand for ATP, someone with MD will undergo anaerobic respiration to supply this. So as a result, when you test someone's blood for the concentration of lactate, it's of course going to be much more higher. So we can say, an individual with MD will have mitochondria that do not produce as much ATP as usual. As a result, this demand is supplied through an increase in anaerobic respiration. More lactate is produced. And so the concentration of lactate in their blood after exercise increases. The lactate eventually leaves the muscle via facilitated diffusion. So the first mark is for saying that the mitochondria do not produce as much ATP as usual. You could also have said that aerobic respiration does not produce as much ATP as usual. So the second mark is for saying that for an individual with MD, anaerobic respiration supplies the demand for ATP. And so the final mark is for saying that as a result, more lactate is produced and the lactate eventually leaves the muscle by facilitated diffusion. A small amount of DNA can be extracted from mitochondria and DNA sequencing used to try and find a mutation, lines 18 to 19. From this sample, how would enough DNA be obtained for sequencing? And also, how would sequencing allow the identification of a mutation? Well, in order to obtain enough DNA for the sequencing, you would have to use an amplification technique known as PCR. So we can say in response to the first bullet point that sufficient DNA can be obtained through PCR. Now, secondly, in order to use sequencing to allow us to identify a mutation, we simply have to compare the DNA sequence with normal DNA.